before we get started on the card, did anyone else in any other podcast give their audience a plus 1220, a 12 to 1 parlay that hit last week for free? I don't think anyone did, dude. Uh, nah, nah, not at all. Not for the free ski anyway. You- Hello, and welcome to the Golden Octagon MMA Podcast. I am Matt Anderson. On the other side of your screen, although not as respectful to our sacrifices this weekend, he is Thornton Rose. How you doing this week, man? You madly Leo Fu. Uh, <laughs> good, man. Good. Just, uh, just, just admiring the work, man. Um, just, just admiring the work here that you, uh, that you managed to concoct here. So, oh goodness, I had the, to do the, it, man. The disrespect. The disrespect. I had to do it, man. I had to. Let me get our lights turned on here. This is the Golden Octagon MMA Podcast. I am Matt Anderson. Dorian Rose is on the other side of your screen. This weekend, we've got Kamzat Fight Week, baby. UFC 279, Kamzat versus Nate Diaz, dude. I couldn't be more excited. Dorian's a little bummed out for some reason about this damn card. I have no clue why, but uh, how you been this past week, man? Once again, walking around with your pants down because you ain't got no belt. Man, uh, doing good, coming off a, a big sports weekend, you know, first weekend, a, a college football kicked off, so hit a couple bets on there, um, hit some bets on my on my UFC, so I had a pretty good weekend, awesome card this past weekend, um, and then topped off with the, with the killer main event, so uh, good card last week, and, and just this week, a little more somber th- than usual, uh, but just due to the circumstances, but we'll we'll get into that. Indeed, indeed, man. So, give you guys a quick rundown on what to look forward to on today's show. We're going to give you a quick recap of UFC Paris. You know, we have to announce our, our, our pick champ. Just give you a quick rundown on what happened. We'll talk about some fight news and some announced fights that just got um, announced right now uh, over this past week. And lastly, we'll give you our picks and our opinions on this weekend's upcoming fights. UFC 279, Kamzat versus Nate Diaz, the whole card. We're going to tell you who we think is going to win each fight. But before we get started, if you guys wouldn't mind, treat that like button like Kamzat is going to treat Nate Diaz this weekend. And uh, subscribe if you are not. Comments are always appreciated right down there below. Uh, Let's get into it, man. First topic of today's show, Um, UFC Paris, man. Uh, I guess... uh, it felt like a pay-per-view leading up. I don't know why all week. It just, I was like, is this a fucking pay-per-view? But it wasn't. It was a fight night. Um, to me, it was a massive card. It lived up to it. I cannot explain how stoked I was. And before we get started on the card, did anyone else in any other podcast give their audience a plus 1220, a 12-to-1 12 parlay that hit last week for free? I don't think anyone did, dude uh no nah, no nah, not at all not for the free ski anyway usually they try to add a little yeah, i've seen groups the discord they charge the yeah, discord. They the, <laughs> yeah oh, i got my picks here for you know 50 dollars a month but uh yeah not not for the free ski no not for the free ski dude so we'll um we'll just start right there at the main card tied to vasa versus uh zero gone aside from that uh mit, that second in like round two dude uh Cyril Gaon just outclassed Tai Tuivasa. The body shots were lethal. I don't like remember if uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't like remember if you remember last week. What am I saying? I don't know if like you remember last week, but I said I think Cyril Gaon is like going to get Tai Tuivasa out of there with a body shot. And damn, if he wasn't close to it, he was destroying Tai to the body. In my opinion, that went exactly how I thought it was probably going to go. Aside from Ty dinking him, like at one point he dinked them and he synced them, like he said he was going to. But uh, I guess your main takeaway from the fights, besides just the dismantling of Ty Tuivasa for Cyril Gaon. Uh, really, my main thing was that I thought Cyril Gaon, 
he did what we sort of anticipated him doing. So outside of that little flurry there in the second round, but I thought he really answered um, all the all the questions that we kind of had for him. Uh, we haven't seen him as far as you know answer the adversity of the striking, but we haven't really seen Cyril Gane in a position to where he has to really face true adversity in a fight outside of the Francis and Ganu fight. You know, he, he hasn't really been hurt and put on his butt like Taito Ivasa put him down. And uh, and you can say after the fact, it does look like it was more of like a flash knockdown because Cyril Gane was able to get back up and get himself composed pretty quick. But we've never seen him put on his butt before in MMA. And uh, we've never seen him kind of face that type of adversity to get put on his butt and have to fight back. And he kind of had to show that dog in him because I think Tato Ivasa knew that, you know, Cyril Gunn was a much more slick boxer or much more slick kickboxer and that he was going to have to make it a dog fight. And Todd did everything that he could to make it a dog fight. But I just thought that Cyril would kind of separate himself from, honestly, the rest of the division. Um, I really think at the top, you know, you're talking, you're talking Gunn, Aspinall, uh, and Ganu, and, and, uh, maybe Blades, but I mean, I, I wish I could have seen the Aspinall and, and Curtis Blades fight play out more, but I think Cyril Gunn really just cemented himself as the uh, the top heavyweight, and I really wouldn't be surprised if, if he was able to get a title shot off that win. Indeed. So we're not going to spend too much time on this. It, it, it did happen last weekend at this point. So moving on down, Robert Whitaker versus Marvin Vittori. Our first different pick of the night. I did think that Marvin was going to uh, pretty much hold Rob up against the fence for the all three rounds because that's what Marvin does. To be fair, I don't really have a strong feeling toward either of these fighters. I just wanted to pick against Robbie Bobby Knuckles. But uh, anyway... I feel like round one was pretty close, and then round two was just all Rob. Round three, all Rob. Just a classic Rob fight, just picking at Marvin. And, dude, to be fa- to be honest, he dismantled Marvin way more than I've seen Izzy do it. Both times, dude, he put a di- – uh, he put on a uh, – a, what, what am I looking for here? A clinic. A clinic. He put on a he put clinic. On a clinic. <laughs> he put on a clinic over Marvin Vittori, dude. It, Marvin had no chance. Um, anything else on that fight uh, besides I picked wrong and you were clearly the right one? Yeah, man. Just really that Robert Whitaker. I think the biggest thing for him is that he really doesn't get enough respect for being one of the top middleweights that honestly the the UFC has seen. Um, as far as middleweight, he's his only losses, his two losses are, are Israel Adesanya. Other than that, every middleweight he's gone up against, he's undefeated in middleweight outside of facing Israel Adesanya. And that second fight was really close as well. So um, I just like for uh, Robert to go out there and sort of assert himself. And as you said, in that second round, he got super physical, ended up attacking Marvin. Looked like he had Marvin kind of wobbled there a couple times. He landed some big right hands, landed some big head kicks. That signature one-two head kick is absolute money. And besides Israel Adesanya, he lands that on every opponent in every fight, and he ends up staggering them with some uh, with that same head kick every time. And uh, I think for Robert Whitaker, another th- just like Cyril Gaon did, I just think he's separating himself from the rest of the middleweight division. Um, I think that as far as his talent, I think it's Izzy, I think it's Whitaker, and I think it's it's everybody else in the middleweight division. And of course, you have Alex Pereira coming up, but. As far as the overall well-rounded ability and just stature and and the uh, resume, Robert Whitaker is definitely one of the best middleweights that we've seen, and, and it's time to start putting res- some respect on his name. Without a doubt. And for all the people out there saying that they want to see Robert Whitaker versus Paulo Costa right after this fight, dude, it, what are they not seeing, dude? I swear Bobby Knuckles is probably going to snooze Paulo Costa. <laughs> Yeah, because Costa goes in there and he tries to leave his chin up too much, and he almost got clipped by a tired Blue Rocco with his hands on his knees. So I can't imagine what a well conditioned Whitaker would uh would end up doing. It could be a good fight for as long as it lasts, but I, I do think that's a fight as well. Whitaker could finish. Indeed, dude. So you picked right on that one. I did pick incorrect. Dorian is up one this week. Uh, our next different one that we did pick on uh, Nasruddin Imavov taking on Joaquin. Buckley, dude, you did pick Buckley. I went with a favorite here. I felt like it was um, in the cards. People that are uh, long rangey, throw good knees, they always give Buckley uh, issues on the inside. And just at range, dude, he was picking them apart. Um, although Buckley used to, I guess, tire out like as the fight went on, dude, 
He's improved a lot, dude. Buckley has um, has that gas tank all the way until round three now, and I actually thought that he did have that round three against Emma Vol. Uh One judge was like 30-27 or something like that. I don't agree with that. I was going for Emma Vol, but I thought it was a clear loss in the um, in the third round for um, Emma, Emma Vol. Shout out Buckley. Just showing that, you know, he's not going out without a fight, and he's always live. He's always game. And, dude, he may have got him involved out of there with, um, like, possibly a few minutes left. Um, shout out Joaquin Buckley. But I did pick him involved. We are tied now. Um, anything on this fight, man? Um, yeah, I thought that the reason why I picked Buckley going into the fight, because I did think that, as you stated, his gas tank has gotten a lot better. And you can even see the some of the small progressions that he made in his last few fights. Um, coming into this and he's kind of uh, he's kind of seemed to have uh, to have leveled up a little bit since uh, since losing that fight to I believe it was Alessio de Carico. he's he's made sure to not go out there and you know completely uh, try to get that knockout in the first round you know the the knockout will come I think the biggest thing for him is that uh, he was just at such a size disadvantage um, at, at middleweight and I think him for him it would almost seem like the best for him to be would be to move down to welterweight. I don't know. I know he used to fight at welterweight before he came into the UFC. Don't know if he's able to make the weight now, but just as far as size wise, if once he starts getting up toward the top of the division, you're right. There's a lot of big guys. I mean, six, two, six, three, I think Buckley's five, nine on a good day. And he, he's as strong as an ox and even had good uh, get ups when Nasser Dean was able to take him down. So he does have a lot of skill. But I do think when he'll start topping out uh, once he starts getting to, towards the top of the division, just due to strictly to the size, man. You know, you being five, eight and fighting six, three guys who's able to keep the range. Um, although he did have a valiant effort there in the third round, as you said, put on a put on his or put his heart on his sleeve out there and was able to go out there and kind of uh, leave it all out there and, you know, hats off to him for the performance and, and Nasser Dean, uh, those first two rounds, he, he also put on a clinic and uh, it was a good fight overall. Indeed, man. Uh, overall, just a good performance from both. I learned a lot from both in that fight. Glad uh, Imovov got the, um, got the win though. So we're tied up right now. Um, moving on down to the next one, Alessio DeCherico. Taking on Roman Kapilov. Roman Kapilov gets the third round KO, dude. I feel like he probably could have got that a lot earlier if he just put on the gas. But Kapilov, super fucking patient. He looks a lot younger than what he actually is. Like, he looks like he's probably, like, early 20s. But he's, like, um, early 30s, like, at, at this point now, um, I believe. Yeah, he's uh, – well, I can't even see it now. Their age isn't there anymore. Only the fight stats. I, um, I believe he's like a few years younger. Like he's now. 31. Yeah, he's 31. So, but he looks way younger than that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was because of the hair. I think it was really because yeah. of the hair more than anything. He, I feel like, is this guy related to Chase Hooper or what? But anyway, uh, he gets the third round KO. Anything um, on that fight, man? Um, also, Alessio uh, retires uh, after that fight, too. Yeah, not too surprising. Like I said, Alessio DiCarico, he did. Uh, he's been awfully chinny and, and the losses that he's suffered so um doesn't really surprise me but roman was able to kind of keep his composure there in the third round and, and land that uh land that beautiful punch once he got him backed up against the fence and uh it was a it was a beautiful knockout and i think he got the bonus for it too so it was a it was a heck of a punch yeah and moving on down to uh william comis taking on jarno aaron's dude um at the beginning, we were like, why is this fight on the card? And they're like, you never know, because, like, fucking last time, like, in um, like fucking San Diego, the Yasmins, dude, they put on a hell of a performance. This one, dude, the whole fight, I'm like, why is this on the main card? <laughs> the, the, the whole fight, dude, I was like, bro, the, this shit sucks. I, I don't really care. Uh, William Gomez gets the third-round decision. Anything on this fight, man? Uh, and I'm not going to lie. I, I've had to watch some of this card after the fact. I kind of skimmed through it once I kind of seen the way it was going. Uh, you're not, it, you're, it, you're not. It, it wasn't with our picks. So I wasn't really super concerned with the result. Yeah. You're not missing out on anything, man. But what is concerned with our picks is this next one's Charles air Jordan taking on Nathaniel Wood, dude. This was our closest one in odds for the night. You had a big underdog. I had a big underdog. This was the closest one, but I did take the slight underdog at the time in Nathaniel Wood, dude. 
Um, and I got to be honest, after I made that pick the rest of the week, I was like, fuck, dude, Air, like Air Jordan, I feel like he might come out. He's for sure going to be like the bigger guy. What if he just takes him down and just fucking subs him like right away like he did? Um, who uh, was it, Arosa? Or Orlando Orosa. Venata. Yeah, Lando Venata. Arosa beat him, yeah? Or some shit like that. Uh yeah, I, honestly, it, it, yeah, it, I don't. I they don't all know, kind, kind of interlude with one another. <laughs> yeah. I just remember, I just remember the sub against Lando Venata because you yeah. were laughing so fucking hard because Lando Venata's pants were about to come off because uh, <laughs> Charles Jordan almost squeezed the life out of him. I remember you wouldn't stop laughing about that. That's the reason why I remember. Dude, I remember he got up and his pants are around his thighs. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, he jerked his pants off. <laughs> I thought that was possible, dude. So I was, I was nervous all week. Uh, I did. Uh, have a few bets like on Jordan by finish, you know, just to cover my ass in case I lost the belt. I wasn't <laughs> going to lose any money, but um, Nathaniel Wood gets the dub, dude. Uh, in third round, um, a decision, dude, pretty much just hitting uh, Charles Jordan with the uh, amount of foot sweeps that you see in like uh Thai kickboxing, dude. It would just happen over and over, exerting no energy on the takedown, dude, and just. Pretty much just outclassed Air Jordan. And what I consider to be, I don't think Air Jordan was as fresh as he could have been. He just now fought Shane Burgos not too long ago. I feel like with a full training camp, this could go a lot different. Take away from the fight, man. Um, I I couldn't have really said it much better myself. I, I was really just surprised that Jordan um, just kept getting taken down with the with those sweeps, you know, over and over again. It just really was head scratching, you know, considering that he was the bigger fighter going into the fight. But it also goes to show that technique, it doesn't matter how big or strong you are. If you got the perfect technique, uh, you can take anybody down. And Nathaniel Wood was able to do that. And, I mean, Nathaniel Wood is coming in off of pretty pretty short notice as well. He fought, uh, I believe, more. Uh, it was a little bit sooner than, than, uh, than Jordan. Uh, it was, uh, it was, but yeah, but, it, but I feel like Shane Burgos, Charles Rosa, like the damage oh, that you're yeah. going to absorb in those two fights is is not the same. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not even close as far as quality of opponent. But just as far as I want to give Nathaniel Wood his credit as well, and just saying that you know he kind of took this fight relatively short notice as well. But he does look good at. Uh, it looks good at featherweight now. Looks big. Looks strong. He still has pop on his punches, even fighting up a weight class. So, um, really, honestly, just a really good performance by him. I was able to outsmart uh, Jordan and, and get the win and, and keep moving up the division. Dorian did take Air Jordan. I did take Nathaniel Wood, and that gets me my third, uh, my second dub of the day. Two out of the three, and still, baby, pick champ again this week, dude. Even though we had a bye week, dude, I've been having this shit for a while now. And he keeps going to say, he's going to say, I felt bad for you. At what point do you feel bad for me for having it for a, like, I have it like, I have, like, I'll have it like a month and then he'll have it for like two weeks. And then I'll like, I have it for like two weeks again. He'll be like, yeah, I just felt bad for you. I had, I had to give it back to you. <laughs> like, well, you look like a little, little sad. You look like a little sad puppy when you, when you don't have it. So, oh, I mean, I, I, I give so you the, I give you the I beat. Have it. So I'm surprised. I, was say, like, I, I got to take that shit back. <laughs> nah, I, I give you the, I give you the beat so much in UFC four. I got to let you have uh, uh, I got to let you have something. All right. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. So that is the main card. Uh, from this past weekend, UFC Paris. A few other takeaways from the card. Uh, Abbas Makhamedov gets the 19-second front kick over Dustin Stolfoots. Pretty much just put his toe in his mouth, knocked him clean out. Um, Faris ZM gets the third-round uh, decision over Michael Figlak. Michael Figlak was the favorite coming into that. Faraz ZM showing that he does truly belong in the UFC, was signed back into the UFC for this fight specifically so that's a uh, kind of wild uh benoit saint denis indeed did get that uh that dub dude i was like remember uh do finish not sub because he like even though he likes sub i he could finish him could knock him out dude put his lights out dude uh christian quinones uh puts kahi uh we call it tahas lights out and stephanie egger 
pretty much my lock of the night, dude. Stephanie Edgar by sub. I think it was like plus 250 or something like that. It was literally in every single one of my bets. And sure enough, she did get that sub. Kind of had me worried there, not going to lie, because I was like, damn, it's getting down to the end of fucking round two now. And she hasn't even went for one yet. Like, what the fuck's going to happen? But in a round two, she did get that sub with like, I think like six seconds left in the round. I jumped up. I was like, yeah, first fight of the night. I'm already fucking clapping, dude. But hey, I wasn't the only one excited. UFC, Paris, that entire stadium was damn near packed. It was, it was early in the night, dude. Fans were cheering nonstop at like fight two, dude. Pretty crazy. Any other takeaways uh, from the whole card, prelims, any other, any other thing like that, man? Yeah, I, I thought, you know, similar to the same, that's what I was going to say was shout out to the crowd was because uh, – Man, like you said, they were packed from the first fight in. They were, uh, you know, and for the main event, of course, they're going to cheer on their guy, uh, Cyril Gunn. I loved when Tato Ivasa came out to uh, Moulin Rouge and everybody kind of gave him like a deadpan silence and just let him come out to the song with with nothing going on. Uh, booing Tato Ivasa during the fight, but then afterwards, uh, when Cyril Gunn gets to finish, the crowd just absolutely exploded as Cyril Gunn's walking across the octagon. But then the level of respect they showed for Tai Toivasa after the fight as well. Um, so I think the same thing as you said. That Paris crowd was awesome, and I'd love to. I'd love for them to to bring another fight back there. That crowd was electric, and you could feel it through the TV. Any other takeaways from the uh, prelims or anything like that? Any other um, like fucking standouts? Uh, n- nothing in particular. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. I didn't get to watch too much of it, but good to see Nasrak hack for us. Um, seeing that, you know, kind of called that that fight was, you know, the way that it was going to happen to, by decision. But Nazareth Hackprice has faced a lot of adversity over the last couple of years and then had the loss to, uh, I believe he lost his mom not too long for the Dan Hooker fight. Then he lost to Bobby Green uh, on short notice, too. So uh, needed to get a dub, and it was good to see him get back and get a get a win. Did you, did you win any uh, bets this weekend, man? Oh uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I hit one of them on a parlay with uh with like Robert Whitaker. Um, it was a uh, Nasdaq hack price by points, and it was a uh, I can't remember the other leg I had, but I had one of them. And the only reason why I was upset at the finish in the Cyril Gone Tatoi Vasa fight was because I had Cyril Gone, uh, basically five dollars to win ninety two. And all Cyril Gaon had to do was let Tato Ivasa last another 30 seconds because I had Cyril Gaon in four, five, or decision. And Tato Ivasa got finished with 30 seconds left in the third round. So, unfortunately, I only hit one bet, but uh, just load up the account for another hit uh, potentially this weekend. All right, cool, cool. You got anything like fucking loaded up um, alert for this weekend? Because uh, for some reason, I just got odds like a few minutes ago, like right now. So, bro. Uh, I mean, nothing, nothing crazy just yet. Cause like I said, I, I didn't get the, uh, I didn't get the props until today. I hadn't really looked at them too hard just yet. I looked at some of the, uh, I, I'm telling you for some reason, decision, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. But, uh, I, I think that decision, bet might be, uh, might be a way to go. Possibly dude. I'm not sold on that shit at all. So Enough fodder. Let's get into the fight news this week, dude. I've uh, actually just been asking you some questions so I can get the news pulled up. I don't remember if uh, this one was uh, on the show last week, but I'll just sh- shout it out again. Billy Q, Billy Cortilla are going to take on Alexander Hernandez. UFC 282, December 10th. Uh, we got Dorian is returning. Uh, Bruno Silva. <laughs> Guess who you're fighting this time, dude? Damn. Dude, that's a quick turnaround. I guess uh, who... de- December seventeenth against a killer dude, Albert Dryev, <laughs> Bruno Silva, Albert Dryev. Definitely going to be a fucking banger. That's the guy that just now fought um like fucking Buckley, Buckley. not too long ago. Yeah. yeah, dude. So that's going to be a fucking banger. Someone's probably going to sleep in that fight. Whether it's um, I don't know, dude. I, fuck that. I don't know. Um, Shamil Abdurakim oh, oh, was supposed to fight Jelton Almeida this weekend. Jelton Almeida this weekend is now going to fight Anton Turkali. Uh, looks like a big guy, dude. I don't know. I think uh, Jelton Almeida is probably going to fucking molly whop him there. Uh, Jennifer Maya versus uh, Marina Moros added to uh, UFC November 19th event. That is shit for this weekend. Um, this past weekend. Let me scroll up just a tad. Results from this weekend. 
And then uh, we got one right here. Don't know who those guys are. Drinkus Duplessis versus Darren, the Gorilla Tail dude. Let's talk about this one for just a second because I know you are pretty stoked for this one. You are high on Drinkus here. Tell me why. Uh, yeah, the I, honestly, it's, it's a mixture of both. I'm high on Drinkus and I'm, I'm not really too sold on Till at middleweight. Um, now, obviously, those those welterweight cuts, you know, the, it took the life out of him. But I thought that's where he was at his most competitive. Seems like a middleweight. He's kind of had trouble finding his ground. He's been getting taken down very easily. Um, been getting, you know, Derek Brunson, you know, just absolutely controlled him and, and mauled him for for the whole fight. I think Till's going to be um, a little bit smaller than Drake is going into the fight. Now, he does have good size on him. Darren Till does. But Drake is a pretty big dude, man, and I think uh, he's got good power. And I think one of the things that Till struggles with, he is a good counterfighter, but he does struggle with a lot of pressure. And I think that's one thing that Drake is definitely going to bring is the is the pressure and the striking. He has really good kicks, and I think if Darren Till tries to do one of those lean backs like he does with one of Drake's kicks, it can end up uh, being a being a short night for him. However, dude, if Drake comes in there round one like he did last time, dude. I'm sure that Darren Till can counter him, dude. Drikus literally needs to go run a marathon before he, he, he fights Darren Till, dude, because this dude needs to be tired first because, dude, he was running, like, head first, swinging like this, dude. And uh, who did he fight last that just, like, stepped off to the I'm side and just, just kept – cracking him dude if brad tavares can do that i'm sure that darren till can also do that i gotta be honest i like till's chances there but it'll be interesting dude we're gonna see um moving on next andre petrovsky taking on wellington Terman, uh ufc 281 november 12th uh the teammate of old uh nate and nick diaz next um nick maximov going to be taking on uh light skin curtis blades uh jacob malcoon on October 15th. <laughs> Light skin Curtis Blades. I can't say I've heard that one. I cannot say I've <laughs> heard Am I wrong, one. though? <laughs> They're like the, the same guy. Curtis, just look, Jacob look, Malcoon, look you're faces. talking about Robert Whitaker's teammate, right? Yes. Dude, I look, at look at their at faces it. like side by side. You're like, oh, they're, they, there's some lineage down there. They're, they are related. And uh, probably – the last one just announced about an hour ago the banger that everyone has been waiting on dustin the diamond poirier going to be taking on iron michael chandler and that is on ufc 281 msg madison square garden that is the izzy card that is uh zhang versus carla um yeah two title fights and that one is going to be a banger of a card in madison square garden immediate thoughts on the fight finally being um announced and I, I know it's been in the talks now for damn near like a month now but it's finally signed it's gonna happen immediate thoughts dude yeah i i felt like that it's always kind of been there uh I, I never felt like that i know it was official t- today i almost felt like that it was always official you know a lot of the fan art that i've been seeing uh for the ufc 280 it's 281 uh, a lot of the fan art I've been seeing has included Poirier and Chandler on that card. It's been talked about for a while, but super excited. Uh, a super fun mashup. You know, I'm I'm high on Chandler as far as his ability, but you also know that I'm high on Dustin Poirier as well. So that's going to be a fight that it's going to be hard to try to choose a fighter who to root for. You just want the the most entertainment and, and violence. And these are two dudes that are absolutely going to bring – uh, bring the pain and go in there and and slug it out with one another. So I'm super excited that it's finally put pen to paper. Yeah, probably. Uh, and then just a little bit let down for me personally. Uh, Viviani Anarujo and Alexa Grasso has been rescheduled again, dude, uh, for uh, October 15th. Why do they keep doing this? They've already tried to put this fight together like 15 times. Two of my favorite fighters uh, at 125, dude. I don't want to see it. And then I got caught up by watching. Tabitha Ricci squeeze this damn watermelon on my Instagram feed. Dude, that looks like a tough watermelon. I'll, uh, I'll be sure to send it to you later on uh, in the day uh, after the show, dude. That watermelon looks really tough, dude. It looks like a delicious watermelon, too. Uh, that being said, dude, let's move on down to what everyone came here for. Our picks, our thoughts, 
on this weekend's upcoming fights, UFC 279, Kamzat Chemaev versus Nate Diaz. Um, and then, uh, so I'm going to give you the fights top to bottom right now, and then we'll start giving you our picks. Or, yeah, how, what am I saying? I'll give you the fights bottom to top, and then we'll give you our picks top to bottom. So, up first, the early prelims. This is going to be at uh, 6 p.m. on the East Coast. We got Darian Weeks taking on Johan Lanus. Uh, Melissa Martinez taking on Elise Reed. Chad and Helliger taking on Alatong Haley. Norma Dumont taking on uh, UFC debut for Danielle Wolf. Um, then we got uh, Jake Collier taking on the Beast Boy, Chris Barnett. Uh, Dennis Tululin taking on Jamie Pickett. Jelton Almeida taking on uh, Anton Turkalis. Uh, Hakeem, mean Hakeem Dawadu taking on Julian Arosa. And then our main card, kicking it off, we got Johnny Walker taking on Ewan Kutalaba. Irina Aldana taking on Macy Chasson. Kevin, the Trailblazer Holland taking on D Rod. Daniel Rodriguez, the Leech, Lee Jin Liang taking on Tony Ferguson, our first sacrifice of the night. And then lastly, Kamzat Chemayev taking on Nate Diaz, our last sacrifice of the night, dude. So no tough names for me this week, dude. I was able to get them all out. No um, no toughness. Maybe like the Turkolage guy. I don't know if that's how you say it, but that's how I'm going to say it. That's the only new one that I know, and I feel like it sounded pretty okay. So we'll start there at the main card, dude. Kamzat Chemayev versus Nate Diaz. You see I got my Kamzat shirt on. Kamzat, Boris Chemayev. Would it say three fights, 66 days? I would have preferred the two fights in like fucking 10 days. That's a lot cooler, in my opinion. Two different weight classes, like absorbed one punch, fucking, <laughs> you know, like those stats. But you did three fights in 66 days. He went down to welterweight in, uh, in that amount of time, too. He went from 185 to 170 in 10 days, just to put that into perspective. I know, dude. It's crazy, dude. This is bananas, dude how do I start this dude I feel like there's been like um, the immediate thoughts when this fight got announced was like what the hell this is going to be an absolute massacre but I almost feel like as it's gotten closer dude I see a lot more people are like man but Nate Diaz man but Nate Diaz bro I don't get fuck that shit Nate Diaz is going to get crushed I got uh Kamzat by absolute demolishing Probably round one or um, early round two at the latest. I don't think this sees a round three. Um, dude, I've just seen – I've watched so many highlights this week of just fucking Nate Diaz getting, like, suplex cityed by fucking – like, fucking Roy McDonald and then <laughs> uh, getting his back taken by fucking Leon, dude. Those two things specifically, bro, Kamza is either going to take Nate Diaz down pin his hand down and fucking ground and pound his fucking head through the cage. Like fucking Nate Diaz is going to have a cage indention about an inch deep in his fucking head, or he's going to get choked out unconscious with his eyes open like the leech did. Your thoughts on this fight, man? <laughs> uh, Yeah, man. I think overall, so did you know, when the fight got announced, I thought the same thing, you know, why would they make this match up? It's just just weird, to be honest. Um, just really more somber than anything, because it's just the it's the it's the beauty and the I guess the the beauty and the beast of the UFC as far as uh, you know the two sides to them. You, you know they put on the entertaining shows and stuff every weekend, and you know we're always tuned in. But this is some of the nasty side to them as far as them trying to really really thumb it to Nate Diaz on, on the on the way out the door because they know that it's his last fight on his UFC contract and he's trying to fight his contract out. I listened to his interview this morning with Brett Okamoto and honestly, I came away from the interview just, you know, probably loving him even more than what I already did. Um, he said one of the stipulations that he had told the UFC that he was the re-sign was that he wanted to make sure that everybody on his team was in the UFC. And he said the UFC would look into it. And then he said they came back to him and said, oh, well, potentially, you know, we could put one on the contender series. We could put one on the ultimate fighter. And Nate Diaz said, are they in the UFC or are they not? And they said, no, not necessarily. 
and Nate Diaz said, fuck it. I'm fighting my last fight out in the UFC. And he said, if it takes Hamza get me out of the, or to get me out of my last contract, I don't give a fuck. I'll fight anybody. And I just love the chip that he had on his shoulder. And I know this is dumb. Dude, I don't even care. I'm rooting for Nate Diaz. Even though I like Hamza, it's nothing against him, but I'm absolutely rooting for Nate Diaz to get this shit done this weekend. And I'm picking him to get it done. So I think unanimous decision. Hamza has holes in his game. Um, I think Gilbert kind of exposed some of those games, uh, some of those holes in his game a little bit as far as I think he could be drawn into a brawl. Um, I think that if he does get a little bit of the who wants to be the bigger gangster and try to slug it out with Nate Diaz. I think that's where Nate Diaz can take advantage. I'm absolutely rooting for him. This is all heart, not with my mind. And I, I, I want Nate Diaz to win, so I'm picking Nate Diaz. Dorian going all out at this point. He's like, I've been trying to pick with my head the past few weeks now, and I've gotten nowhere. I'm going with my heart at this point. <laughs> Dorian picking Nate Diaz. The what like what what is he as an underdog like minus or plus seven? I think he's like plus seven hundred. Plus yeah. seven hundred right now. Going with the plus seven hundred underdog, dude. I feel for you as a fight fan. You cannot not be a Nate Diaz fan, dude. Every time like he fights, he it's just entertaining, dude. He's turning his back. He's showing you his ass. He's flipping you off, dude. It's entertaining no matter what. Um. I just don't think the tactics are going to work in his favor, dude. You show Sham, um, you show Hamza like your ass, dude. He's going to grab you. He's going to throw you down. He's going to maul the fuck out of you. Like, I, I just, I don't see this going well at all. One more, one more point before, um, uh, like we get off this, dude. I this pops into my head mid every single week, and I forget to ask you, dude. I see Jorge Masvidal all the time saying that he thinks Nate Diaz is going to beat Hamza because Hamza is a leg-humping wrestler that just wants to take people down and hold them down for three rounds. I'm convinced that Jorge Masvidal doesn't know who Hamza is and has never seen him fight. Uh, no, I, I honestly think it's just more of him just trying to uh, push Hamza back because Hamza's been a little bit mouthy towards Jorge as of late saying he's not a real gangster and blah, blah, blah. And had a lot to say about Jorge here recently. So I think Jorge is kind of more shitting on him just to try to try to basically block some of his shine a little bit more than I'm, not really I'm acknowledging just like, who he is. Does he not have any, like, when has Hamza took someone down and just held them there? <laughs> like, that's not what he does at, like, at all. Like, not even in the slightest. So moving on down. Uh, so Dorian is going – Nate Diaz here. I'm going Hamza Chimaev. I don't understand why Dorian's uh, doing that to himself. But uh, moving on down, first pick, different of the night. We're going to try to get five today because it is uh, the pay-per-view. But I don't know, dude. It's going to be kind of tough. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It's a, tu it's, a tu it's a tough card to try um, to have that many different picks on. For, like, fuck, maybe we can do, like, an over-under on, like um, – um, on like one of them, it, like if we don't have a difference, or if we think, or I mean, we we could probably we could come up at worst case, we could at least come up with three. Worst yeah, case, fair enough. So moving on down next, we got the leech Legion Liang taking on Tony Ferguson, dude. Our uh first sacrifice that we're gonna see of the night, dude. Before I ask you about this fight, dude, I almost feel like we have similar opinions on this fight dude tony hasn't fought at 170 since the ultimate fighter correct which is 2012 exactly so that's fucking literally 10 years ago so tony ferguson has been fighting 155 since then tony ferguson's body is is for is uh primed and cut for 155 at all times at this point you're telling me he's going to move up to 170, which isn't the – it's, like, the biggest, like, fucking weight jump that you find outside of, like, fucking light heavyweight, like, the heavyweight, like, that can be, like, it, like um anything at all. It's a 15-pound weight jump. He's putting on no size. He got knocked out cold four months ago, dude. He's had no time to recover. His body is still the same size, put on no muscle mass. He's going to be fighting one of the biggest 170 pounders there is that has absolute knockout power. Just now crushed Muslim Salikov that has a good chin himself, 
crushed Santiago Ponzinibbio off of like a three-year layoff. So you know his chin was as fresh as possible. And Tony thinks that, dude, how is this a good fight? Who, who accepted this fight for Tony Ferguson, dude? This, this is, in my opinion, should have a, a worse odds than Kamzad versus Nate, dude. This is rough for Tony, dude. What what is everyone, ah, dude? This fight, uh, it's it doesn't need to happen, in my opinion. I'm not even a huge Tony fan. I'm just like, damn, this is not gonna be good, dude. Bleach is probably gonna crush him super early. He he might last a little bit, but in all reality, he's probably gonna get knocked out. Um, yeah, I was just, I was, you know, just scratching my head just, it, just as much as everybody else was when this, when this matchup was made. And I really think that it, and it hasn't been talked about as much this week, but it almost feels like that Tony Ferguson is getting a similar treatment from the UFC. He as well has been a little bit mouthy towards the UFC as of late, as far as them, uh, giving him a proper treatment and proper pay and uh, things of that nature. And I do think that this is another thing that they're trying to do to him to also get him out the door at his lowest stock point. Um, you have him move up a weight class. You 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 get a guy like Tony Ferguson with the mentality that he has, that he's another one of those guys. He fights anybody, anytime, anywhere. Um, and he's not scared to fight anybody. He's got the similar mentality of Nate Diaz, which is why it's kind of ironic to – to see them both in a similar position, fighting a guy that's much bigger than than uh, than themselves are, and uh, pretty big underdogs going into the fight as well. So um, you could have put Tony Ferguson against Nate Diaz in the, in this main event, and I think it could have done just as well, just because the the entertainment value of both fighters. But it almost feels like a, as you said, a sacrifice. But I I hope for Tony. I really hope that he's able to go in there and get it done. Um, maybe the move up to 170 will replenish his chin. I just think as far as the size advantage and, and Leach's boxing, Leach actually has, he's tied for the most knockouts in welterweight history right now with Matt Brown with 13. So it just goes to show that the work that he's put in in this division uh, to really get the, the finishes that he has. And and I really I really do feel for Tony, but I think that Leach is going to be a little bit too big, and I, I think he's going to be able to get it done. Yeah. Uh, do you like? Do you think he knocks him out, or do you think he goes to decision? Man, so I do think Tony's super tough. I think the move at the one seventy is going to be good for him. I do think that. Um, I thought that that shot from Chandler, dude, that was a kill shot, and that's going to knock out just about anybody. It was such a clean kick that he landed. I do think that Tony can survive. I just think he's going to be completely outgunned because he's going to be fighting a guy that's much bigger than him, who's got just as good at boxing and he's taking this fight on kind of short notice as well. So, um, yeah, I think that leech, I think he'll get it done by decision, but I think it will be, uh, it might not be a good night for Tony. It might be a long night. Dude, the over under Seth is at two and a half too. So not dude, like even if we wanted to pick like the over under, it's almost like decision or you think he's finished him. So if it comes down to it, I think leech probably finishes him. Dorian says by decision. So uh, moving on next, it's funny that you say that you think that Tony Ferguson like reminds you of uh, like fucking Nate Diaz because Daniel Rodriguez reminds me of Nate Diaz, dude. We got D Rod Daniel Rodriguez taking on Kevin Holland. I think D Rod's trying to get a lot of Nate Diaz's fans this um, upcoming weekend. He's he's been pretty vocal about how. Um, like, you know, he's, like, the same as them. Like, he just wants, like, try to take their fans. Um, But to be honest, dude, Nate, I mean, um, like, fucking D-Rod also doesn't fight too often, just like the Diaz's, dude. So, who who the fuck knows, dude? Going to be taking on Kevin Holland. I am going the trailblazer here. Uh, I don't know if he finishes him, dude. Um, And if he does, it's probably a little bit later on. The only thing that concerns me as far as the D-Rod side here or that gives me hope for Kevin Holland on the D-Rod side is uh, um, like the white Grant dude. I saw him crush D-Rod, dude, and Kevin Holland's bigger than uh, him. He, I believe he's a little bit faster, longer. 
I think Kevin Holland for sure should get it done here. But D-Rod, dude, doesn't lose. Um, only lost once, yeah? Yeah, it's a Nicholas Dalby, which was a bullshit split decision. Oh, I'll, I'll tell two, you, he should have. Two split decisions in his entire career, both split decisions that, that, that he lost. So pretty much damn near undefeated, never been finished, anything like that. I do think that could change this weekend, dude, because as I said, dude, when he fought like Dwight Grant, did like, he get dropped? Uh, yeah, Dwight Grant dropped him, but uh, yeah. Dwight Grant's got some – Dwight Grant's I know, got I know, really but, good power. But I feel like the striking difference between Kevin Holland and Grant is a little bit different, and Kevin Holland's for sure got power. Shown that at 170 and 185 at this point. Put out the dirty bird, dude. That's your guy. You should know. <laughs> yeah, which I mean, but I mean, what he he's thirty eight at this point. So for Tim Means, it, it's a little bit different, and and plus he's Tim Means has kind of been there and done that before, you know. As far as you know, D Rod, he's a little bit older. You know, people don't 35. expect D Rod to be as old as yeah. People don't expect him to be that age. But as far as fight age, he doesn't really have that many fights now. The only reason why he hasn't really fought that much over the last year or so is because uh, some injuries that D Rod has had. So that's that's the only thing that you can really explain to the inactivity. I believe he tore his ACL, but he was pretty active in the UFC before that, that injury that he had. And um, this fight was actually scheduled, I believe it was two years ago before Kevin Holland ended up moving back up to 185 and facing Anthony Hernandez. Um, Kevin Holland was actually supposed to face Danny Rodriguez. So just a little bit of a backstory going into this fight this weekend. Um, there's probably going to be a little bit of tension because Danny Rodriguez has been saying he's been trying to get a hold of Kevin Holland for a while. And uh, he finally gets his opportunity. D-Rod's a gangster, man. He he walks forward. Um, he, he But he's actually super slick with his defense. And he's got good boxing as well. Now, as far for Kevin Holland, we all know the story with him. Loud mouth, but uh, super good. I think since he's made the move down to welterweight, he has become more uh, focused on the fight game professionally uh, to get himself down, to take the fight game more serious. Whereas in the uh, in the Derek Brunson fight and the Marvin Vittori fight, you know, he's kind of laughing with Habib over on the side. In this instance, he's taking the fight game a lot more serious, taking the weight cut serious. He's looked really good so far. Don't think he finishes D-Rod. D-Rod is way too tough. But um, I, I think this fight is going to be super fun. This fight is not going to be um, – I don't think Kevin Holland is going to wash him. I, th- I Excuse me. I believe this fight is actually going to be fight of the night. Um, I, I think it's, it has fight of the night written all over it. D-Rod goes out there. He gives it his all. And so does Kevin Holland. And both of them come out there to bang. I think it's going to be a, a unanimous decision uh, for Kevin Holland. But it's going to be fight of the night as well. Fair enough, dude. Fair enough. As you said, dude, both fun fighters. Uh, one thing to note, uh, like before we move on, is that uh, this fight is a catch weight at 180 pounds, um, and a little sprinkle, maybe just possibly Kevin Holland by sub. If anything, I do believe Kevin Holland by sub is probably live um, in there. Uh, people don't give Kevin Kevin Holland uh, credit for his black belt, dude. The dude is a black belt and he knows how to use it. He's actually got a few subs, and no one pays attention to it because everyone's like, ah, he's just going to knock everyone out. Uh, I might put a – what's the odds on that right now? Just Kevin Holland by sub. Right now it's a plus 600, dude. Maybe worth a little – something like like a little two-leg or something like that. Uh, Moving on down, dude, we've got uh, Irene Aldana taking on Macy Chasson. Um, I'm a Macy Chasson fan a little bit. But you know I am much more heavily an uh, Irene Aldana fan. Uh, where is this going to be at? This is going to be in Bantamweight, dude. So you're telling me Macy Chasson already has trouble making weight uh, to begin with, and this is going to be back down at 135. Irene Aldana, known for crushing chicks. I got Irene Aldana probably by knockout, if you ask me. Who you going here? Uh, yeah, I think this one's pretty easy as well. Chasson has had trouble – as you said, making the weight class. And I, I believe Rocky ended up actually finishing her. Rocky Pennington did, um, which I know it was due to the wrestling, not due to the striking. But I do think Aldana is going to be a little bit more well-rounded. And she's got a pretty good triangle, too. Um, so I think Aldana is going to be more well-rounded. Aldana, uh, easy. Fair enough, fair enough. One that I kept asking you about last night, dude, and you were just silent every time I asked you about it, dude. Johnny Walker versus Ewan Kutalaba. 
Right now, Iwan Kutalaba, about a two to one favorite. Do you think Iwan Kutalaba is going to crush Johnny Walker? I personally do. I'm going uh, Iwan here. How do you think this one goes? Man, so I, I guess I've just been kind of back and forth because Johnny Walker is obviously Chenny at this point. Um, you know, a lot of people were high on him coming into the UFC, myself included. Uh, when he knocked out Khalil, uh, you know, Khalil Roundtree, it really, really kind of surprised me. I never seen Khalil dominate at that point. So I kind of, for Johnny Walker, I was like, man, he's the next big, big thing. And unfortunately, since that Corey Anderson loss, I just hadn't really seen the guy it together. But I think for uh, Kutalaba, you know, he, he's also up and down as well. And now he's fought a lot of big names. Michael Matt, Uncle Laev, He's fought Glover Teixeira. He's also fought Khalil Brown Dree, um, Dustin Jacoby. He, he's fought a lot of really good guys at, at light heavyweight. He's super up and down, though. And his last couple of performances, I think it showed in that Ryan Spann fight. Ryan Spann was so much bigger. And Ryan Spann is a huge 205 or two. But he was so much bigger than Kuzalaba when they went into that fight. I thought that that, that was going to give Kuzalaba a problem, and it absolutely did. Kuzalaba was able to land a big sh- – or uh, Ryan Spann was able to land a big shot on Kuzalaba and was able to get the sub and get him out of there. Dude, for some reason, I feel like Johnny Walker might be able to do the same. I feel like he might be able to actually land like a money shot on him. I don't know if he's going to be able to uh, finish him with the knees. I don't know if he's going to finish him. I, I, don't th- I don't suspect him finishing him with any type of submission. But for, for some reason, I just have this feeling that uh, Kutalaba, just the way he's up and down and kind of walks forward, Johnny Walker is one of those guys who's a counter striker and can and is pretty good at setting traps. So if he's able to kind of do one of those traps similar to how he set up Misha Serkinov with that flying knee, I think he's able to uh, land maybe a big punch off of a of a Kutalaba rush in and, and get him out of there. So you going Johnny Walker here? Yeah, yeah, I'm going Johnny right. Walker. I'm going by knockout. Fair enough, dude. The the only two two counters I would have to to say uh, to what you have is um well one uh, before I get into it, I thought that Iwan Kutalaba was gonna crush Ryan Span because I thought Ryan Span was chinny. Uh, in turn, Ryan Span crushed Iwan Kutalaba, so it kind of surprises me that Iwan Kutalaba is the two to one favorite over Johnny Walker here. Um, now your counter, now the counter to what I have to say is uh. John Kavanaugh broke Johnny Walker, dude. I don't think he is putting the pr- putting the pressure on anyone um, at this point. So the only um, hesitancy I have into actually betting E1 is uh, the Johnny Walker by decision, dude, because I just feel like Johnny Walker. Uh, just look at at the um, a lot of the Tiago Santos fight, dude. It's like, bro, I, this has all the chances to be super boring uh, as well. But I think Ewan likes to rush in a lot, so I don't. I'm not really leaning toward that. I'm kind of either leaning toward um, Ewan by knockout or fucking Johnny Walker by decision. Um, anything on what I have to say, or you want to move on out of the prelim? Uh, no, I do think that's an interesting point with the John Kavanaugh thing, just because we haven't seen the explosive Johnny Walker that I was just saying that we might be able to see coming from the Misha Serkinov fight. You know, he had his team in Brazil that he was fighting with, and it does seem like ever since he's been with John Kavanaugh, he's been much more reserved. The only thing I'm hoping is that uh, Johnny Walker more just falls back on his instincts more than kind of just falling back on what the coach is kind of getting in his ear and telling him. And I think for his instincts – is that explosive athlete looking to make a, a big highlight. Now, he is susceptible to being taken down, and Kutalaba is uh, – he's known to use his wrestling to, to try to get himself a win. So, I could see Kutalaba getting a, a win just by going to unanimous decision for wrestling. But I do think Kutalaba leaves his chin up a little bit too much for my liking. He's been hit plenty of times. Magomed Ankalaev, Ryan Spann, uh, Glover Teixeira – um, those are all good fighters, but he's been hit plenty of times. And I think Johnny Walker, if he can kind of hone in all his skills, I think he could potentially do the same. And I'm kind of more just hoping that Johnny Walker gets it together at this point because it's like, dude, I mean, if you can't get it together against Kuzalaba now, I mean, dude, I mean, here, here's your pink slip, man. You, you got to get out of here at this point. Dude. dude, I like this is probably the one that I'm just so like unsure on pretty much on like all the fights uh, in the entire card, dude. It's like, Bro, I don't know who the fuck's gonna gonna win this fight. This is the one that I have. Like, I have a bigger, um, like a bigger pull on bigger underdogs than 
like what this fight is than Ewan on a two to one favorite, dude. <laughs> like I, I feel like it's definitely live. He could for sure lose this fight. So let's move on down to the prelims, dude. Uh, we got Mean Hakeem Dawadu taking on Julian Arosa, dude. Um, Hakeem Dawadu, uh, right now a minus two fifteen favorite over Julian Arosa, the plus one eighty five, and uh, you know who I'm going here? I'm going. Julian Arosa, we've just seen him spoil the party too many times for these up and comers like Nate Landwehr, dude. Uh, who else did he spoil? That was a big one. Uh, he's he's had a couple of because uh, he's he's had a couple of knockouts. Julian Arosa's Julian Arosa, Charles party. Jordan. Um, one more. Uh, Sean Woodson, dude, spoiling three top contenders right there, but then goes on. To uh to fucking lose against goddamn Steven Peterson, dude. So it kind of makes no sense. He has flashes of brilliance, dude. He can he's great. He's shown that he can be great, but then you lose to Steven Peterson, and it's like, bro, what what the fuck happened there? Um, I'm going Julian. I thought Arosa. he beat I, I thought he beat Peterson. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> he, he did beat Peterson. Yeah, yeah, I thought but, he beat uh, Peterson. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a close fight, though. But like, like it wasn't clear. Like fucking, right. like fucking Stephen Peterson put up some uh, some fight to him. It was a rather close fight. But like, it's like, and I know you don't like Stephen Peterson either. So, yeah, true, true. <laughs> you know why I don't see it like Stephen Peterson? Anyone that watches this, the reason I don't like Stephen Peterson is because when he fought Chase the Dream Hooper, he went for a fake glove touch. And hit him, dude. That shit was on the early prelims. Dory was making fun of me about how I was so worked up about this fight. Bro, fuck that guy. You don't fake glove touch. Fuck you. Anyway, um, I'm going uh Juicy J here. Who you going? Me and Hakeem? Uh yeah, man. I, I do like Hakeem. Hakeem is uh he's super sharp, super uh super crisp with the striking. He's got good taekwondo. Um he, he's he's uh he's got good wrestling defense um i believe uh he because i think he lost to mobzar vloyev as well but um mobzar vloyev had a lot of trouble with hakeem in the third round and of that fight he he won the first two rounds cleanly uh mobzar did but then in the third round um yeah uh hakeem dowdu started putting the pressure on him and uh and showed his uh showed his true ability so I think that he'll be able to. I think Julian Rose is going to be a little too tough to finish. I do think it's going to be a unanimous decision, but Julian Rosa comes to uh, comes the bang, dude. So this as well. I think if that D Rod and Kevin Holland fight doesn't get fight of the night, this one might spoil it. Um, I'm sticking with my prediction of Kevin Holland and, and D Rod getting fight of the night, but this one's going to be this one's going to be right up there as well. I love the I love the matchup for the main event of the prelims. Fair enough, dude. So that is our third different pick uh, of the day. Dorian going mean Hakeem. I'm going juicy J. Jelton Almeida taking on Anton Turkali. Um, late notice, Jelton Almeida was going to fight uh Shamil Abdurakimov. Uh, so it ain't late notice for him, but uh, late notice for Ang- uh, Anton uh Turkali. I don't uh, like he usually fights at 205, so late notice for him. I believe he's going to be the smaller guy uh, against Jelton Almeida. Jelton Almeida uh, by finish is the way I see that one going because I don't know anything about Anton Turk College. What about you, man? Uh, same and same. And it's just because uh, what, the only thing I really know is Jelton Almeida. And Jelton Almeida is an absolute savage. And I think he's going to be a problem for anybody at heavyweight. I think he's going to be a problem for anybody at like heavyweight. That dude's a savage, and he's he's uh he's gonna be around for a little bit. So yeah, definitely give me Jelson. Indeed, indeed. So moving on down, Dennis Tallulah taking on Jamie Pickett. You would not catch me betting on Jamie Pickett ever. I don't believe he belongs in the UFC. I'm going Dennis Tallulah here. Um, Dennis Tallulah lost six times, but if you look at his losses, dude, it's all against some Dagestani wrestler. Jamie Pickett is not that guy. I'm going Dennis Tallulah without a doubt here. Um, and because I don't feel like he belongs in the UFC. <laughs> uh, I do think that Jamie Pickett, he can uh, he can be a little slick when it comes to his striking. Um, he, he does have pretty good power, but he can also get picked apart a bit as well. Um, 
but yeah, I do think that even though I don't know much about um, Dennis Tallulah, I do think the same. I think uh, Jamie Pickett's a little bit prone to getting taken down a lot, so I think you might see Tallulah uh, go that route and maybe uh, get a submission. Fair enough, dude. So moving on down, dude, Jake Collier taking on the Beast Boy, Chris Barnett, the opener of the regular prelims, dude. And, bro, Jake Collier should not be a minus 400 favorite over anyone in the UFC heavyweight division, dude. Dude is a former middleweight, but he's a minus 400 favorite over Chris Barnett, dude. Um, I don't even what – what are we doing here? I, I don't know how this goes, to be honest. Um I don't feel comfortable on making a pick for either one of them because it's like minus 400. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm definitely not putting any money on Jake Collier. <laughs> I, I know that for a fact. Yeah, I, I'm I'm saying as far away from that as I can. But uh, I think we were kind of talking about it a little bit last night. Dude, I, I kind of think that, you know, Chris Barnett did have that nice highlight against uh, – against John Volante to get that that spin and heel kick. And, you know, that's going to be on UFC highlight reels for a long time. But um, – and he's, he is a good athlete for his size. Dude, he's so undersized at heavyweight. And honestly, as far as, like, his skill overall, like his boxing and stuff, he's not really UFC caliber. I know you were saying that you didn't think that Jamie Pickett is. Dude, I really don't think that Chris Barnett is really UFC caliber. I think you heavyweight is just an easier division to make it in the in uh in the UFC just because they're they're so desperate for like big personalities at the heavyweight division and, and Chris Barnett is definitely that and he's a fun fighter but I definitely do think he's going to have the odds stacked up against him you know J- even though Jake Collier is a former middleweight and uh he's also fought at light heavyweight dude he's basically just a, a fat middleweight and fighting a heavyweight but I do think I do think he does have some uh he, he does have some skills he does have a, a pretty nice spinning back kick um, so I do think that he, he's a little, uh, more crisp in the striking that people give him credit for. I, I think he'll probably just end up getting a unanimous decision. I just think he's just better all around than Chris Barnett, really. I'm curious, what's the over under set on, on this fight? Because if a lot of people think this is going to go under, that would surprise me just. Yeah, I, I would, I would have to imagine this is going to be at two and a half because if it's at one and a half, I might yeah. actually slam that. Yeah, the over under is at two and a half, and uh, both, dude, minus one oh five for over and minus one twenty five for under. So, no one really has any fucking clue what <laughs> what's happening in this fight, dude. It pretty much makes no sense. I guess we'll both go Jake Collier. Uh, moving on down to the early prelims, dude. Uh, Norma Dumont taking on UFC debut Danielle Wolf. She is one and zero. Oh. She has her one lone fight on the Contender Series. Um. Former pro boxer, dude, but I believe she's 37, 38 at this point. Um, if you ask me, dude, Norman Dumont's path to victory should be go out, take Daniel Wolf down, and sub her, dude. Um, that's the way I see this going. Uh, Norman Dumont via submission. How do you see this going? I mean, to be fair, Norman Dumont's fight IQ isn't the best. I've seen her just stand and try to box with – other females that she was clearly then not as good striker as so as long as she doesn't do that dude she should win but if she stands there right in front of uh d- fucking daniel wolf she's gonna get her lights put out yeah one of those fighters that she tried to stand in front of was megan anderson and megan anderson ended up putting her lights out that one time uh and she also in her macy chance on fight because i'm going back through and looking at some of her fights now and they're kind of Coming back up as I'm seeing them, I do remember Macy Chiasson kind of kind of setting traps for her, and and Macy Chiasson was just way too slick for her overall. Um, Norma Dumont does come in there; she 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 can get lured into a brawl. Danielle Wolf, uh, I, I don't know what was the hold up for her fighting. Was it injuries or, or something like that? Because um, um, she was on the Contender series like it almost felt like what two years ago at this point. I think she was on just the, the fact uh, she she was injured for like a little bit, and you got to think this is at one forty five. She no way she makes one thirty five, dude. She she's a big girl, right? But I mean, just as far as I mean, Norman Dumont's been in the UFC since twenty twenty. I think Danielle Wolf was on the 
the 2021 contender am I or is it what the 2020 contender series either way she's been she's been was considered a prospect for the UFC for a long time and it's just it just seemed like she's been put on ice for no reason but um so we haven't really been able to actually see her go out there and fulfill her talent but I do think that Norman Dumont can get clipped a little bit and who knows uh a little bit of a wild card let's say Daniel Wolf gets the knockout Oh, wow. So Dorian going with Daniel Wolf in our fourth different pick uh, of the day, dude. Rather surprising. Uh, you're just you're just trying to – you're just fucking playing, throwing darts in the fucking dark at this point, just trying to win this belt back. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I ain't, got no, I ain't got no money on it, so I'm good. <laughs> Moving on down, we got Chad and Helliger taking on uh, Alatong Haley, dude. Um I got to go Chad and Helliger here. I don't know why. I just feel like Alatong Haley is a little bit overrated. Uh, he just kind of tends to get into brawls, but not really put on pressure that much. I don't know, dude. Um, yeah, I'm going uh, Chad and Helliger here. The underdog, plus 145. Uh, yeah, and he's also coming off a, a pretty decent win himself. Um, give me uh, – I'll keep it short this week because I don't really know too much about either. Or uh, give me Alan Taylor G. <laughs> you said what? Alan Taylor G. Is that <laughs> what it is? Alatong Haley. <laughs> Alatong Haley. Yeah, Alatong Haley. I don't know uh, that. Yeah, uh, he was a good prospect uh, at the beginning, but now it's just kind of like, eh, bro, not so much anymore. Uh, and then moving on. Oh, I did uh okay, it didn't fall out. Ooh, I got nervous. I was like, nah, that was one of, one of my locks of the day. Um, Melissa Martinez, UFC newcomer, taking on Elise Reed. Uh Elise Reed, the underdog here, dude. Um it kind of surprises me because she does have some UFC experience and her only like losses were to people that took her down and just ground and pound, fucking knocked her out. Uh, like Melissa like Martinez is a um is a minus one sixty five favorite here, and she does not wrestle at all. Straight up striker. Um, I like Elise Reed as the underdog here, and uh, I don't know why. Uh not gonna lie, not too familiar. Well, I'm, I'm a little more familiar with Elise Reed. I'm not super familiar with Martinez, so um, I would say the the UFC experience should probably play on Elise Reed's side, but. Um, a lot of times they set up these prospects for a reason as well. But uh, you know what? Wild card, Martinez. All right. So that is our fifth and final different pick of the day. But um, I expect at least one of those to fall out. So uh, this one could be different. Darian Weeks. Dorian got called this a lot growing up. Uh, I remember multiple teachers calling him Darian growing up in high school and, and middle school and such. But uh, yep. Darian Weeks taking on Johan Lanus, dude. Johan Lanus um, throws every single shot he throws with absolute 100% power, and he gasses. He's got about uh, a round in him, and then it's fucking done for. Uh, Darian Weeks last fought Ian Gary and shown that he can take a punch, and he's got that three-round gas tank. A little sprinkle, if you ask me, that Darian Weeks – third round finish i believe is for sure live in here um he's got to watch out that round one but if he can put that pressure on round two he's for sure getting that round three finish darren weeks i'm calling it i'm going darren weeks um yeah i i think so as well i think darren weeks is a little uh he, he's got good defense i think he showed that against Ian gary um, I think the biggest thing is that we really hadn't seen too much of his offense really get uh, get off. He's kind of had two tough matchups with Ian Gary and, and Brian Barberina coming into the UFC. So, hadn't been able to see his full potential just yet. And I think against Johan that he will have the the potential to kind of show his full strength. I think the same thing as you. Um, I, I think Darian Weeks. I, I think by decision, though. I don't, I don't think he finishes him. Uh, Darian Weeks hasn't really showed that killer instinct Bro, of mine uh, that, that I like you. to see. But Lohan, Johan is done after round. Dude, go watch it like his last fight. He's done like two minutes into the first round, dude. It's like, bro, you just threw everything. After this podcast, dude, I promise. It's like, it's like two rounds. 
go go back and watch that. You're gonna be like, oh wow, dude, this dude. There's no way. There's no way this dude lasts three rounds in any UFC fight. I'm telling you, like it's like he tries to be like fucking Yuri, but it lasts for about two minutes. <laughs> him and then he's done. Uh, so that is our different picks. I am still this week's reigning and defending pick champ. So uh, Dorian going Melissa Martinez. I'm going Elise Reed. Uh, I am going Chad and Helliger. Dory, wait. Like, did you do, um, like Melissa Martinez or did yeah. you do at least three? Wait, hold on. Oh, uh, Melissa Martinez. All right. Dorian did Melissa Martinez. I did at least read. Uh, did you do Alatong Haley or Chad Ann Helliger? Uh, Alatong Haley. All right. Yeah. So, Dorian going Alatong Haley. I'm going Chad Ann Helliger. Uh, I could have swore you said like fucking Danielle Wolf, too. So now I'm like, is that I three did. different ones? I did. How many fucking different ones like do we have now? Uh, too many. I don't, this I don't know. <laughs> I am going Norman Dumont, Dorian going uh, Danielle Wolf. So that's three. Moving on to our prelims, and yeah, we didn't have any. Uh, yeah, I am going uh, Julian Rosa, Dorian going Mean Hakeem. That <laughs> we got do. six, <laughs> dude. And then uh, our main card. Dude, do you want to take the comms out versus Nate off, or are you just yeah, let's take it off. All right, yeah, let's take it off. I'm Dorian, more Dorian, than. Dorian had some shock value for the beginning of the picks. He he just wanted to 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 pick Nate Diaz, but uh, he is going to officially switch his pick to comms on Jemaya. Dude, what made you change your pick, man? Uh. What? Man, Johnny honestly, I'm just trying, I'm trying to I'm I'm trying to get the picks down to over the, the five, Johnny Walker so. versus Ewan, dude. Uh, I mean, honestly, I feel really I feel really good about that one. I'm more just I'm more rooting for rooting for Nate at this All point right. more so, than kind of thinking that he'll, he'll get it done. So our different ones at this point: Johnny Walker, Ewan Kutilaba. That's one. Hakeem Dawadu versus Julian Arosa. That is two, and then. Our last three are on the early prelims. Norman Dumont, Daniel Wolf, Chad Ann Helliger, Alatong Haley, and Melissa Martinez versus Elise Reed. That is our five different picks for the day. Yeah. 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 We oh, can man. I was yeah, I was going to say either that or remove the Alatong Gailey, because I'm honest, I'm not super familiar with that fight. And we could do the Hamzat Nate one for the picks. Whichever. Whatever. Loop we got six out. picks in case one of these shits fall off too. So it is what it is. I am the reigning and defending pick champ of the week still. Dorian ain't getting this shit. Look at fucking Dorian trying to do the fucking Nate Diaz. 209, baby. <laughs> this is going to be this is a fucking uh, going to be a crazy non-title fight pay-per-view we do got to pay for it dorian's uh upset it still but it's all right hopefully you're a little bit more excited about the fights now than you were before if not oh well you're still gonna watch that shit i am matt anderson on the other side of your screen is dorian rose remember the sacrifice happens this weekend we got two fights uh anything before we get out of here man 209 baby <laughs> all right for that that being said I'll catch you Monday for the card video next Thursday for the podcast. This is the Golden Knockdown MMA podcast. We'll catch y'all next week. <laughs> Peace.